from David Vanderbilt. Um, so David is the uh, Board of Governors Professor at Rutgers at the moment since 2009. Um, he did his uh, undergraduate studies at Swarthmore and his PhD at MIT in 1981. Then he was uh, a postdoc at Berkeley for about three years and then joined uh, Harvard University as assistant professor and then became associate professor there until in 91, he uh, went to Rutgers as a professor. Um, he's a fellow of the APS. He's got, uh, he received the 2006 Raman Prize in Computational Physics from the APS. Um, he's a member of the National Academy of Science and also the uh, National Academy of Arts and Sciences since 2019, of science in 2013, and many other, uh, you know, awards. Um, he's been a driving force in um, computational methods development, I should say, with inventions like the Vanderbilt Ultrasoft to the potentials. But I think what he's, he's mostly known for is being, I would say, the father of what's now known as the modern theory of polarization and magnetization. And, you know, I think it's a feat if you have to rewrite the Maxwell textbooks <laughs> for new insights in electrons and magnetism. So this is his famous paper on how Barry faces in K-space can help you calculate and define spontaneous polarization and things like that. He wrote a recent book about that in 2018 from Cambridge University Press. And all of these ideas now have even found, you know, more interesting forms in... Uh, with the advent of topological physics. And I'm sure that's um, one of the things he'll talk to us about. Uh, he also developed, you know, how closely related all of this is to one year functions and hybrid one year functions. And um, so it's, um, and most of all, I, I should say, I've always enjoyed David's talks and his books and his papers because they're very pedagogical. So I'm really looking forward to your talk, David. And with that, take it away, please. Okay, great. Thanks so much for the invitation. I'm uh, sorry that I uh, can't be there in person. Um, uh, so I think you're seeing this on, on the screen. Um, uh, right, so, um, uh, so what I want to do is to talk a little bit about uh, a couple of types of uh, topological um, systems, uh, topological insulators. Um, the history, <clears throat> and this is my view of the history of the field, sort of uh, started in uh, 1988 with uh, Haldane had a model for a two-dimensional uh, kind of topological insulator that will be the topic of like half of this talk, which is the quantum anomalous Hall effect. Um, uh, <clears throat> in um, uh, uh, in the last 20 years, um, these ideas have started to see realization. The quantum spin hole effect is kind of a doubled version of um, the uh, quantum anomalous hole effect involving up and down spins in a two dimensional uh, system. Uh, going up to three dimensional systems, um, there are what people now call uh, uh, three dimensional topological insulators or sometimes strong topological insulators. For example, the well known bismuth, bismuth selenide class. And again, the dates, uh, 1988, uh, the quantum spin hole effect was discovered in a laboratory um, in um, a mercury telluride um, in, um, uh, films in 2007, then this bismuth selenide class materials in 2008. The uh, quantum anomalous hole effect itself uh, took a little bit longer, uh, was not demonstrated experimentally until 2013. Um, uh, so uh, this is a part of what I want to talk about. Um, part of the reason that I've chosen to talk about the quantum anomalous Hall effect is that in my view, it's kind of the, the father or the mother <laughs> of all topological insulators. It's the, uh, <clears throat> in a sense, the prototypical simplest uh, type of topological insulator that's really robust. And so uh, it provides a prototype for understanding uh, other more complex systems, for example, the, the three-dimensional systems. So I'm gonna talk about that. And then I'm gonna talk about another kind of uh, three-dimensional uh, topological insulator that's called the axion insulator, uh, where the surfaces of this axion insulator behave in some ways like the quantum anomalous Hall effect. Not quite, but in, uh, in some ways, yes, and in some ways, no. 
And um, these axion insulators, um, for the most part, we don't have good experimental realizations yet. We have one or two that are, uh, I think, behaving in the right way, but there's some controversy about uh, uh, whether they're, uh, at least in the bulk form, whether they're true versions of this axion insulator. So the second part of the talk will be about these axion insulators that I'm hoping that the development will continue. And in the next five or 10 years, we'll have two or three um, uh, good three-dimensional versions of axion insulators, and we can see what we can do with them. Uh, they are generally uh, magnetic systems instead of non-magnetic systems. So uh, a, a good part of the talk will be about uh, magnetic aspects. So uh, let me just uh, give you a little bit more background about what this uh, so it, throughout my talk, QAH stands for Quantum Anomalous Hall, which is this first type of uh, topological insulator that I want to talk about. And then here you see where I'm going with the, with the rest of the talk. Uh, OK, so I think uh, everyone's familiar with the ordinary Hall effect. Uh, here, uh, you have an ordinary metal. For example, it might be copper. You apply a transverse magnetic field to break time reversal symmetry. You drive a current through the sample, and you measure a transverse voltage. And uh, that represents the, um, the Hall effect. Uh, it's basically the Lorentz force that gets attached to the electrons as they move through the sample. Uh, Edwin Hall discovered this. And a few years later, more than a century ago, he also uh, reported the anomalous Hall uh, effect. Uh, I don't suppose he attached his own name to it. But anyway, this is what we call it now. Uh, in the anomalous Hall effect, you don't apply any external magnetic field. Uh, instead, um, the sample itself has to be ferromagnetic. So the the time reversal symmetry is spontaneously broken in, the, um, uh, in, in this metallic sample. And then when you drive a current through it, it shows a transverse voltage uh, in the absence of any uh, magnetic field. Uh, that's the anomalous Hall, uh, anomalous Hall effect or the anomalous Hall conductivity. So here I make a little chart for metallic systems, the ordinary Hall effect and the anomalous Hall effect uh, without a magnetic field. Um, now, a, an enormous development is the so-called uh, quantum Hall effect um, that was discovered, uh, boy, I guess it's now like more than 20 years ago, but uh, of course it was a revolution at the time. And this is basically an insulating system that uh, demonstrates a, a Hall effect. And um, the uh, implementation of this is in terms of uh, two-dimensional electron gas at the boundary of um, a, a gallium arsenide aluminum gallium, gallium arsenide inversion layer. So you create a two-dimensional electron gas, and then you apply a transverse magnetic field. And um, if you studied what happens to a, a two-dimensional uh, uh, free, free, free particles uh, in quantum mechanics, when you apply a transverse magnetic field, you get um, uh, discrete energies that are called uh, Landau levels. Uh, here, uh, they're shown as broadened a little bit by the, by the disorder. Uh, but in between these Landau levels, the horizontal scale here is energy. In between them, uh, there are gaps, uh, at least um, maybe not as clean as in this uh, idealized picture. Uh, and if the Fermi level lies in a gap, then it turns out you get a precisely quantized, um, first of all, you get zero uh, longitudinal conductivity. So the system behaves like an insulator in the sense that if you try to drive a current uh, in the x direction with an electric field in the x direction, you don't get anything. But instead, you apply an electric field in the x direction, you get a current in the y direction. And the, um, the conductivity is an integer times e squared over h. And the integer has to do with how many Landau levels you filled. The integer is called the churn number. And that determines, uh, so here the conductivity is at a half, I'm sorry, Yes, the resistivity is at half, so the conductivity is at two in, in fundamental units. So that's the famous uh, quantum anomalous Hall effect. And so you might ask, well, that's with an externally applied magnetic field on a sample that is intrinsically non-magnetic. Uh, can you have a, a sample, a two-dimensional sample that's intrinsically uh, ferromagnetic? Uh, that would be the quantum anomalous Hall effect. And so in this case, um, if I, uh, I don't need to apply any uh, magnetic field, and if I drive an electric field, this curly E in this talk will be the electric field. If I apply an electric field in the X direction, I will get a, a current flowing uh, in the Y direction. So uh, we call this an insulator because you know, the system has a gap. Um, the lowest energy excitations require some excitation across the gap. But there is a sense in which it's not an insulator, which is to say that you have this dissipationless current that flows in response to a, an applied electric field. You might wonder uh, what happens to this current when it gets to the edge. 
And it uh, turns out that these um, quantum uh, Hall systems have to have edge states, which I'll come to in a moment, to suck up the current that arrives at the edge. So uh, um, that, I'll come to that in a moment. So uh, I mentioned Haldane's paper in 1988. Um, he basically wrote down a simplified tight binding model where he put in uh, first neighbor uh, hoppings and then second neighbor hoppings that were complex. The complex uh, phase of the second neighbor hoppings is a way of putting time reversal symmetry breaking by hand into the Hamiltonian. So this is a Hamiltonian for a ferromagnetic two-dimensional insulator. And uh, he showed that with appropriate uh, values of parameters, you could get into this quantum anomalous Hall uh, condition. Uh, so it was demonstrated theoretically way back there in 83, but then it took a long time before it was demonstrated experimentally or even before the importance was realized. Uh, so uh, uh, here's again this um, uh, quantum anomalous Hall effect. Uh, I've drawn these arrows to indicate that the sample has some spontaneous ferromagnetic magnetization. And then there are these dissipationless edge currents that run around the, the boundary, and I'll, I'll have more to say about those later. Uh, the edge currents uh, have a lot to do with uh, the suggestion for potential applications. Because there's no backscattering, these things can carry current with basically no uh, resistivity. And so you might be able to make very low power electronics out of it if you could do this at, um, uh, at uh, elevated temperatures. Um, OK, so uh, another name for the quantum anomalous Hall insulator is churn insulator. I'll tend to use quantum anomalous Hall in this talk, but these are just uh, um, uh, synonyms. Um, uh, the, the point is that the uh, Hall conductance gets quantized e even in the absence of any macroscopic uh, magnetic field. Um, this type of system is not intrinsically limited to low temperature. I'll mention in a moment that we get up to about 10 Kelvin at the moment, but uh, not higher. But we don't think that there's any fundamental limitation why this could not be um, something that could be observed at 100 Kelvin or, or maybe even room temperature. So uh, it's potentially very useful um, e expansion of what you can do with the ordinary uh, quantum Hall effect, which is really at um, sub Kelvin uh, temperatures. Maybe precision measurement, maybe dissipationless wires, and they're also potential applications for magnetoelectric coupling. Uh, you might get a sense of that later in the talk. So uh, there are three types of systems where um, the quantum anomalous Hall effect has been observed. Uh, one of them is you take uh, uh, three-dimensional topological insulators of the bismuth selenide class and dope them with magnetic um, dopants to make a magnetic semiconductor. So now this uh, film is ferromagnetic. And under the right conditions, you can measure uh, a quantized, um, so the vertical axis here is the transverse uh, conductivity sigma xy, which would be in, in units of e squared over h, which is the quantum that you expect if you have a perfect quantum anomalous Hall uh, insulator, and you would expect that the longitudinal um, conductivity should be zero. So it doesn't quite get there, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's only close here. This is 30 millikelvin. This was the first um, 2013 paper. Um, this group and other groups uh, improved this by vanadium doping instead of chromium doping, and now you're up to 120 millikelvin, and even uh, at 200 millikelvin, you're within 3% of, but you're still sub-Kelvin. Uh, two more recent developments, this one, well, I don't see a date, but it's within the last two years, is uh, this manganese bismuth telluride system where uh, people have demonstrated the quantum anomalous Hall effect at two Kelvin. Uh, again, the vertical axis is the transverse conductivity in units of E squared over H. And you see that it's very well quantized to one. Horizontal here, axis here is an applied magnetic field. So you're actually switching the ferromagnetism from um, up to, to down over this hysteresis loop. But once you're in the, you know, if you return, if you return the system back to zero magnetic field, you're very close to the quantized condition. Uh, you know, again, this type of hysteresis loop has, has to do with domains forming and moving, uh, and that's part of the physics here. And finally, um, another uh, surprise, uh, to me at least, was that in the twisted bilayer graphene story, I don't know if you've had a colloquium yet about twisted bilayer graphene, but if you haven't, you should. Um, there's all sorts of wild things going on, and one of the wild things that's going on is a quantum anomalous Hall effect. So again, 
uh, at the right uh, partial filling with the right conditions uh, with the boron nitride uh, capping layers in the right orientation, you can observe. Uh, so here again is the transverse conductivity in units of E squared over H, and it's getting very close to quantized at, at two Kelvin. And it's still pretty well quantized around uh, six Kelvin. So uh, we're climbing up. Uh, I'd sort of do this for fun is to remind people that the history of superconductors took a long time to get up. Uh, we're not at room temperature yet, but we're uh, getting close. We are at room temperature in extremely highly pressurized systems. And so here's the story, corresponding story for quantum anomalous hole insulators. We're, we're way down here in the, in the one to five Kelvin range right now. But uh, you know, uh, who knows where we'll get to in the next 20 or 50 years. And I, I hope some of the young people in the audience will, will help, us get, help, get, help us get there. So I've told you something about what these systems are. And what I want to do now is to try to explain as best I can in a pedagogical manner uh, what um, it means that this is a, a topological system. You've probably heard the notion that somehow the wave functions are twisted in some way in a, in a topological insulator that like a, you know, like a, uh, 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 you know, the people give analogies to um, uh, Mida strips and so on. But so I want to try to explain to you in, in, in what I think is the most uh, intuitive way um, uh, what, what it is it gets twisted up in the wave functions of a, of a two-dimensional uh, quantum anomalous hole insulator. So I should have said at the beginning that I'd be happy to be interrupted with questions. So I'll pause for a second and see if there's an interruption with a question. And otherwise I'll go ahead, but please do um, feel free to interrupt me. So uh, this, uh, I'll start with a, a, a very quick review of solid state physics. You have a periodic uh, uh, crystalline system and it has energy bands. Uh, we plot the energy bands, uh, N labels the band index and K is wave vector. Wave vector is sort of like a momentum, but it lives in a periodic momentum space that we call wave vector space. <clears throat> uh, the periodicity has to do with the uh, uh, reciprocal lattice uh, to the real lattice. And uh, at each of uh, e each wave vector K and band index N, there's a, a block function, which is the uh, eigenfunction of the Hamiltonian. And it looks like some uh, underlying atomic ingredient modulated by a wave uh, that goes like e to the i k x for a given uh, wave vector K. Of course, K is really three-dimensional here. This is a one-dimensional illustration. If I, if I divide out the e to the i k x and I define this u k of x to be e to the minus i k x times the block function, so then this u function is a periodic function. It's called the cell periodic block function. And um, the formulation that I'm going to describe is written in terms of the cell periodic block functions because we want to be able to take derivatives of them with respect to wave vector k. And uh, for these guys, uh, for different wave vector k, they obey the same boundary conditions, whereas these ones for different wave vector k, they obey, obey different periodic boundary conditions, and that's horrible. So that's why we deal with these cell periodic uh, block functions. Now, in textbooks, you often see the Brewan zone. This is for a one-dimensional crystal. The Brewan zone goes from minus pi over a to pi over a, where a is the periodicity of the one-dimensional crystal, and there's some energy band. I've just run one energy band. Uh, and then you learn that really um, momentum space is periodic because the state labeled the state over here is really the same as the state labeled here, uh, which means another way to think about this is instead of uh, plotting uh, the Brewan zone as a line segment, let's plot the Brewan zone as a as a loop uh, on the on the bottom here, and then uh, on the cylinder where energy goes vertically and Brewan zone is the loop. I can plot the energy band on the cylinder. And that makes it clear that the energy band is living on a closed manifold. And when things live on a closed manifold, then they're susceptible, they're susceptible to topological uh, classification. And so um, there's a thing that you can define on a closed manifold, which is called a Berry phase. And uh, what we want is we want a, a, a loop. And at each point on the loop, there's some uh, uh, quantum wave function. Well, more generally, it could be any complex vector, but in our context, it's a quantum wave function. And of course, what it is, is it's nothing other than this cell periodic wave function UK. So at each, each point along the loop, uh, there's a, I just call them U1, U2, U3, U4. Uh, this is kind of a discretized picture. <clears throat> and what you do is you start with the first one, U1, and you take the inner product with U2, 
and then you take the product inner product with u3 and then you come all the way back again to the beginning to, to, to un which is the same as u1 and then this imaginary part of the log is the argument so we've you look at this as a complex number and you take its, um, you know, its complex phase. So phi is the phase of this thing and the minus sign is there for conventional reasons that we need not worry about. So why is this an interesting uh, um, uh, object uh, to calculate? Uh, the reason is that each one of these quantum wave functions, you know that the physical meaning of a wave function doesn't depend upon what uh, phase prefactor is attached to this uh, wave function. So if I twist the phase of U2 by some global amount, let's say by e to the i pi over seven or something like that, uh, it's the same physical state, but, but does it change this global phase? Well, uh, no, it doesn't. So for example, if I twist U2 by some phase beta, what happens is that e to the i beta appears in the ket over here, but it appears in the bra over here as e to the minus i beta, and those things cancel out. And so uh, this uh, phase, which is called the Berry phase, is independent of the individual phases of all of the individual states on the loop. It's somehow a global property of propagating around the loop. And it's, it's only well-defined uh, essentially between zero and two pi because it's a phase variable. Uh, if we um, take the limit that the density of points goes to infinity, so we basically go to a continuum uh, uh, formulation, uh, then the corresponding uh, formulation of the very like this, you do an integral around the loop. So here, lambda is a continuous parameter that goes from zero to one. You calculate the derivative with respect to lambda of u lambda. If, 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 if lambda is k in the B1 zone wave vector, then this is the, the wave vector derivative of the cell periodic block function. Um, uh, and that's uh, the very phase. And again, that very phase is only well defined find modulo 2 pi, we should regard it as a, as a phase angle. So um, uh, here, uh, here again. Uh, and so um, uh, uh, Walter mentioned that this Berry phase is also related to the theory of electrical polarization, um, but <clears throat> I'm going to sidestep that in, the, uh, 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 in order to um, progress to the topics that I want to discuss. Um, so now I come back to my uh, two-dimensional uh, quantum anomalous hole insulator, or perhaps I have a two-dimensional ordinary uh, insulator, uh, non-topological. How do I understand the difference between these things in terms of these Berry phases? Uh, <clears throat> well, one way to do that is now I have a two-dimensional system and my Brewen zone, which is the, the wave vector space for a two-dimensional crystal, has two, uh, it has a Ky, a kx and a ky momentum wave vector in, in the x direction going, let's say, from 0 to 2 pi and y going from 0 to 2 pi. What I do is I organize um, these into strings. So for a given value of kx, I look at the string that runs along ky and I calculate the Berry phase uh, along that string. Of course, that string is really a closed loop because the system is periodic in the, in the ky direction. And so I plot those Berry phases as a function of kx. And uh, since it's only well-defined modulo two pi, so I drew another uh, version that's uh, displaced by two pi. Um, it doesn't matter which one I use, the physical meaning of the, of the two is the same. Um, uh, and uh, because the system at kx equals zero and the system at kx equals two pi, well, here I call the, I guess I'm dividing by two pi on the horizontal axis here, but anyway, on the left and the right, the wave functions are all the same. So the string Berry phase has to be the same on the left boundary and the right boundary. So, so this curve has to start out wherever it starts out. If it starts out at two, it has to end at two, right? So that's all that can happen, right? Well, some of you are probably anticipating that no, that's not all that can happen. Uh, this can happen, right? This can start out at 1.8 over here. And then over here, it ends up at 1.8 plus two pi, which is really the same as this. And then if I go across again, it ends up up there and so on. So this is also a plausible scenario. And in fact, if you study uh, Haldane's type binding model, this is exactly what happens for Haldane's type binding model. Uh, I, by the way, I mentioned here that these uh, very phrases, uh, if you've heard the term Wilson loop eigenvalues, it's the same thing. To a first approximation, it's the same thing. Okay, so we shifted by some integer multiple of two pi when we came across here. In this particular case, we shifted by plus one integer multiple of two pi. And that means that this, uh, this system is uh, characterized by a churn number of one. Um, if this Berry phase had shifted by four pi, the churn number would be two. 
If it shifts by minus two pi, the churn number would be minus one. And so we can classify different magnetic, oh, and by the way, for the churn number to be non-zero, this has to have broken, <clears throat> broken time reversal symmetry. So it has to be a ferromagnet. Um, so we can classify all uh, two-dimensional insulators by their churn numbers and uh, try to start with a system with churn number one and then slowly modify the Hamiltonian and turn it into something with churn number zero. You can't do it, uh, at least not without closing the gap and making it a metal and then opening the gap again, then you can do it. But, but if you try to do it by keeping the, the, the gap open the whole time, you can't do it because this is kind of a, a winding number. If you, if you think of uh, plotting this uh, on the surface of a cylinder, basically the, the phase winds around and uh, you can't continuously deform something that winds around to something that doesn't wind around. That's the nature of topology. So that's what the churn number is. And that's what a quantum anomalous fall insulator is. It's something where these Berry phases shift by an integer multiple of two pi uh, other than zero and, and give you this behavior. Uh, so I said, I'm gonna try to make this as intuitive as possible. Uh, you have the right to say, oh, this is not <laughs> intuitive to me. Um, but I don't know how else to make it more intuitive than this. Um, this is uh, how I think about uh, topological insulators. Okay, um, uh, I wanna reframe this in terms of uh, the, uh, something called 1A functions. And um, that makes it a little bit more clear why this is related to anomalous Hall conductivity. So uh, here, a very quick um, introduction to 1A functions. Here I have uh, my block functions. Let's say I have six blocks fun block functions. And what I'm going to do is take linear combinations of them, kind of make wave packets out of them that are as localized as possible in real space. So I take a linear combination like this and I make a wave packet that's localized in the first unit cell. And I can make five other wave packets that are you know, localized in the other unit cells. And each one of these is called a 1A function and they're periodic images of one another. Uh, and this is something that you can uh, construct these um, uh, um, you know, on the computer if you've actually solved for the um, wave function in a, in a crystal. And so uh, here in a one-dimensional crystal is a, a toy picture of what's going on. These uh, plus uh, objects are the positively charged nuclei. Let's suppose these are sodium atoms, so they're ions with just charge plus one. And then there's one electron that has to be somewhere. And if this is an insulator, not if it's a metal, but if it's an insulator, I can construct 1A functions. And so I can say there's a 1A function in this cell, and then there's another one in the next cell. And each one of these 1A functions, I can compute this object which is the center of position, or if you like, the center of charge uh, position of the, of the 1A function. And so I can think of all the charge in the 1A function as though it's concentrated in a delta function negative point charge at the 1A center, which is displaced from the uh, ionic center. And it turns out that with a little bit of mathematics, you can show that this 1A center is nothing other than the Berry phase uh, computed for the band that gives rise to this 1A center. Uh, you know, modulo some um, some factor out front. So the so the uh, so as the Berry phase goes from zero to two pi, the one A function moves across the unit cell and goes to the to the next boundary. And um, and so the um, this is the relation then between the one A center and the and the Berry phase. So um, the the uh, fact that the phase is only well-defined modulo 2 pi means that the uh, right-hand side of this equation is only well-defined modulo a, which is the position of the 1a function. Well, that makes perfect sense because it depends upon which 1a function you're talking about, right? In the next unit cell, it, the 1a center will shift a bit by 2a and 3a and so on. So it all, it all kind of fits together. So uh, where I'm going with this is that when I computed these uh, string Berry phases in the vertical direction, I can think of those as 1A centers in the Y direction of some uh, charge packets that are localized in the Y direction. And so in an ordinary crystal where the churn number is zero, the Y coordinate of the wave packet doesn't do anything as I go across the Brie 1 zone. Um, uh, if I um, apply, uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, in, in the uh, topological case, it, it does shift. And where I'm going with this is this allows me to explain why it is that a non-zero churn number gives rise to a non-zero anomalous tall conductivity. So the idea is if I apply a, an electric field in the, let's say in the X direction, 
for you it's this way, x direction. And uh, let me assume that electrons have positive charge to make the story simpler. So electric field applies a force. A force is a time derivative of a momentum. And in um, the solid state theory of transport, what happens is all the wave packets drift in wave vector. Wave vector is really momentum at a rate that's proportional to the force, which is the electric field. So all the wave packets shift across the unit cell. And as they do that, the y centers shift up in the uh, plus y direction. So you get a current that flows in the y direction that's proportional to the electric field in the x direction. The electric field in the x direction is the rate at which wave packets traverse from left to right, but that means that they also traverse um, uh, from bottom to top. This is a weird diagram because the horizontal axis is wave vector space or momentum space in the x direction. The vertical axis is real y space in the y direction. So it's this hybrid representation that's a little bit unfamiliar to people, but turns out to be a very useful way of thinking about things. And you know, it was arbitrary that I picked uh, the x direction to keep reciprocal space and the y direction to be real space. I could move things and uh, consider a string berry phases uh, going across the Brillouin zone the other way and the story would also work. So anyway, if you, if you take this picture and work out what the transverse conductivity is, it's nothing other than e squared over h times the churn number. So that explains why this system is a quantum anomalous Hall insulator. Um, if we want to find a system of this kind, uh, here are some of the things that we want. It has to have broken time reversal in, uh, symmetry. It has to be an insulator. So it has to be an insulating ferromagnet. I want it to be in, atomically thin somehow in two dimensions. Um, I'd like to have a, a pretty big band gap so that if I do any <clears throat> experiments that I can get up close to room temperature, that would be ideal. Uh, systems we have are much, much less than that. And it's uh, good to have strong spin orbit coupling if you know what that is. Um, I, I won't go into that uh, right now because I want to move on. Um, here's one paper that, uh, gosh, this is seven years ago, hard to believe, with a uh, postdoc at the time, Kevin Garrity, where we proposed a system uh, based on first principles calculations that should be a quantum anomalous Hall insulator. We have a substrate, which is a strontium, oxo strontium oxide, which is a simple rock salt uh, insulator. So uh, you're imagining many, many layers of this. And then at this top surface, we have one layer of europium oxide and one layer of gadolinium nitride. Now, the problem is in the seven years since we wrote this paper, no one has been able to synthesize this uh, exact system. Uh, but in our paper, what we showed is that the europium F bands overlap with the gadolinium uh, D bands in such a way that you get this uh, avoided crossing. So this is a plot of the energy levels from a first principles calculation versus wave vector in the two-dimensional Brillouin zone at the surface of this uh, system. And uh, the red things are the um, uh, europium F bands, which are relatively flat. And then this black band coming down is the gadolinium D band. And you get this avoided crossing and band inversion. So band inversion means that the character of the conduction band state here is F-like, which is normally a valence band character. And the character of the valence band state right here is uh, gadolinium-like, which is what is normally elsewhere. So you get a band inversion. It turns out that this band inversion is typically associated with topological properties. And here we show that this thing has a churn number of minus one and a gap of 130 milli electron volts in our calculation. Uh, room temperature is about 25 milli electron volts. So this is uh, uh, six E foldings. That means you'd have pretty good quantization um, of, the, uh, uh, of the anomalous Hall conductivity at room temperature. Um, so um, uh, we have uh, written other papers where we proposed other systems of other people. Um, the uh, only um, known examples to date are the three of earlier uh, doped uh, topological insulators, um, the um, manganese bismuth selenide system, and the twisted bilayer graphene system. As far as I know, those are the only um, experimentally demonstrated quantum anomalous Hall insulators. So what I want to do in the rest of my talk is move on to this other category of system, uh, so-called axion insulators. And to get there, I want to start by talking about, so, so these are three-dimensional systems. And so I need to talk about three-dimensional insulators and their surfaces and anomalous Hall conductivity at the surfaces and edge channels at the surfaces. And when I've done that, <clears throat> I, then I, I can do the axion insulator story pretty quickly. So let me move on. 
Um, so uh, in this uh, picture, I'm imagining that I have a, a two-dimensional um, quantum anomalous hall insulating state. And I said that these quantum anomalous hall states um, uh, at the boundary, they have chiral edge channels. And what would that mean? So what it means is that here's an edge. You imagine that this sample is semi-infinite in the other directions. And, and at the top edge, wave vector k along the edge is a good quantum number. So I can plot band structure as a function of wave vector k. These shaded regions are the projected conduction band and the projected valence band coming from states deeper in here. And it could be that you have uh, a surface state <clears throat> that crosses from the valence band into the conduction band as you move in the positive direction. And if you had such a thing, that would be a quantum anomalous hall insulator. The churn number is related to the number of bands that crosses from the bottom to the top. And so this is a relatively uh, rare situation that this actually happens. If it does, that's when you have the quantum anomalous hole insulator. How do I understand that? Well, suppose I apply an electric field uh, parallel to the edge. So if this is a quantum anomalous hole insulator, it means that that generates, oh dear, what did I do? Went the wrong way. There we go. It generates a current in the transverse direction. And I'm talking about an insulator. And so when the current gets to the edge, if the edge is also insulating, we have a violation of charge conservation. So that can't be. Remember, I'm just talking about the, the ground state of a, of a system uh, in a, a weak applied electric field. That's a stationary state. The stationary state is allowed to have current flowing, but it's not allowed to have charge accumulating because that would be a time dependent phenomenon. So uh, in order to not violate charge conservation, you have to have this kind of uh, uh, edge channel. And the edge channel uh, allows you to carry away the excess current that's arriving at the edge. And if the churn number is two instead of one, you get twice as much transverse current, which means you need two surface states to cross from the bottom to the top. And that's the connection between edge states and um, the anomalous hall conductivity. So, uh, conservation of charge re uh, generates this, what's called a chiral surface state, because it, it basically only, in, in this example, this uh, surface state propagates in the clockwise direction around the boundary. The Fermi velocity is in the clockwise direction. There are no states that propagate in the opposite direction. So it's really a, a one-way uh, conveyor belt that runs around the, the, the surface, uh, runs around the sample. So, uh, this is a, a picture of an insulator in two dimensions, sort of seen uh, sitting on a table from a, a, a point of view. And um, <clears throat> I've defined here a dimensionless version of the surface, uh, a dimensionless version of the anomalous hall conductivity so that when chi is equal to one, that's the quantized condition for a churn number of one. So here, if I have a quantum anomalous hall state on the right, but not on the left, then I have to have this chiral channel. And the, um, uh, the uh, it, and, and, and moreover, anytime I do have a chiral channel, it has to be uh, an integer number of channels, which means that if I have another uh, patch on this surface or a side surface, it also has to have an anomalous hall conductivity of zero or one or two or whatever. And again, that's because if I apply an electric field, I get a transverse current, then the um, current needs to be sucked off by the, by the chiral edge channel. Now, suppose I go to the surface of a 3D insulator, um, insulating surface of a insulating uh, bulk insulator. Um, uh, does the surface anomalous hall conductivity have to be zero? Well, I'll argue that it doesn't have to be. It could be minus 0 0.2, for example, in these dimensionless units. But if so, uh, if there's another patch of the surface, it has to differ by an integer. Uh, because again, the chiral channel, which is responsible for sucking up any charge that occurs in the presence of an external electric field, uh, has, to be, um, has to be consistent with the number of edge channels. So we can define a, a, a dimensionless uh, uh, angle variable theta that runs between a zero and two pi that characterizes the bulk of this system. In this particular case, it's minus 0.4 pi because when I divide by two pi, that gives me minus 0 0.2, 0 0.8, 1.8, minus 1.2 are the possible values of the surface um, and almost whole conductivity if the surfaces are insulating uh, for, for this bulk material. So the bulk actually determines the surface anomalous hall conductivity. And what this theta is related to is the bulk uh, magnetoelectric uh, response. 
So um, I'm looking at the clock and I, I know that when I get to about uh, 4.55, um, I'll just wrap up. Um, so what I'm trying to do is focus on the um, conceptual aspects of the story. Um, and uh, so I'm just going to keep doing that. And if I run out of time at the end to describe some of the potential applications, well, uh, so be it. Okay, so uh, here what I have is a three-dimensional uh, crystal. I'm looking at a two-dimensional surface uh, from a side view, so it looks like a line, and I've got an electric field um, going into the, into the sample. And uh, what is a magnetoelectric effect? The magnetoelectric, uh, oh, I'm sorry, first I should discuss the anomalous Hall conductivity. So uh, <clears throat> there's a surface anomalous Hall conductivity if this electric field generates a transverse current at the surface, right? That's the meaning of the uh, transverse uh, 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 anomalous Hall effect. So the current is proportional to electric field cross surface normal uh, uh, with the, this constant of proportionality. Uh, okay. okay, now what I was just starting to say, um, I can also think of the um, magnetoelectric effect uh, acting in the bulk of this sample. So if I apply an electric field, if the sample has low enough symmetry, it can be that if I apply an electric field that generates a first order magnetization, and let's assume that that's parallel to the applied electric field. So there are materials that do that, like chromium oxide. And uh, I want to talk about the orbital magnetization as opposed to the spin magnetization, because that's responsible for the kinds of currents that I'm interested in. So let's suppose that the orbital magnetization is uh, just proportional to the electric field with some constant of proportionality uh, alpha. And you know that the orbital magnetization manifests itself in a surface current K, and the surface current K is uh, given by uh, the orbital magnetization you know, across the surface normal. Um, and so if I, um, if I compare the uh, formula for the K from the orbital magnetization and the formula for the K from the anomalous Hall conductivity, you come to the conclusion that the two things are the same. The surface anomalous Hall conductivity and the orbital magnetization are one and the same thing. Now, it seems confusing because I mentioned a moment ago that the surface anomalous Hall conductivity is only well-defined up to a quantum of E squared over H, which seems to imply that orbital magnetization is also only well-defined up to E squared over H. And essentially that's true. Um, so uh, one way to see that is that if I have a sample and I bring up to it a quantum anomalous Hall layer, like a piece of Haldane layer and, and glue that to the surface, uh, then I must have a chiral edge channel here because now the anomalous Hall conductivity is larger here than it is here. So how do I decide what value to assign to the um, magnetoelectric um, uh, uh, constant of the surface uh, of the bulk? Do I do it based on the right-hand side or the left-hand side? Well, those two definitions of the orbital uh, magnetoelectric effect will differ by this uh, universal quantum of E squared over H. Th these are not things that happen in ordinary magnetoelectric materials. This is something that you have to get into the regime of uh, kind of uh, interesting, weird uh, materials, topological materials to find these things. But this, this is in principle what can happen and what will happen in the class of materials that I'm interested in. So the, um, this uh, bulk uh, uh, orbital magnetoelectric susceptibility <clears throat> is only defined modulo E squared over H. Let me skip this. Um, that's sort of about the mathematics. Maybe I should say this though. Uh, this, the, the physics of this um, magnetoelectric coupling is basically that you put into the Hamilton, you put into the Lagrangian of the system an E dot B term, electric field dotted into magnetic field. Um, and if you do this in elementary particle physics, um, it's called an axion term in the Lagrangian. And if the prefactor of this axion term is just a fixed background field, this uh, does weird things like it, um, it, um, uh, it, um, it attaches a little bit of electric charge to magnetic monopoles and vice versa. But more interesting, if you treat that as a dynamical field, then its quantized particle is something called the axion, which is a potential uh, a particle that people are searching for as a potential explanation for uh, dark, dark matter. So you know there are connections here to other fields of physics, uh, but I see myself running out of time. So uh, let, me, uh, let me move on. Um, okay, so I said that uh, in general, a bulk material, an insulator, um, 
uh, has a magnetoelectric coupling that's characterized by this theta. Theta is the dimensionless value, dimensionless version of the magnetoelectric coupling that determines what the possible values are of the um, surface anomalous fault conductivity. What's an axion insulator? Finally, axion insulator. An axion insulator is one where by symmetry, theta is uh, forced to be exactly pi, which means that the surface anomalous hall conductivity, um, if these surfaces are insulating, is either exactly minus half a quantum or plus half a quantum. That is minus e squared over 2h or plus e squared over 2h, or possibly plus 3 e squared over 2h. Right? So um, that's what an axion insulator is. How do you get there? Well, it's actually pretty easy to quantize this theta. If you've got time reversal symmetry, it maps theta into minus theta. And if you have inversion symmetry, it maps theta into minus theta. And normally, if you have a quantity that gets reversed by a symmetry and the symmetry is present, then that object has to be zero because obviously if it's 0.2 and gets mapped into minus 0.2, it's not the same thing. However, if it's pi and it gets mapped into minus pi, and it's an object that's only well-defined modulo 2 pi, then there are two possible values that are allowed under the symmetry. There's a, a Z2 um, uh, classification. Uh, Z2 is just the group of two elements. Um, and the, <clears throat> the case where theta equals zero is a trivial insulator, and the case where theta equals pi is a topological insulator. And, um, uh, and this uh, provides a, a topological classification of all three-dimensional insulators. And um, this is actually a part of the story of bismuth uh, selenide. So bismuth selenide is a system that has theta equals pi, and it's because of time reversal symmetry. Well, actually also inversion symmetry. But if the uh, theta equals pi is protected only by inversion symmetry and not by time reversal symmetry, then we call it an axion insulator. And so what we are trying to do is to understand uh, can we somehow come up with new materials that behave like an axion insulator? And if we can, what could we do with them? And the big advantage of these materials is that the surfaces are automatically half integer quantum anomalous Hall effect. Now, you might have said that was also true for the time reversal invariant case. And let me explain why, what the, what, what the big difference is. So, um, uh, so in either case, if I have uh, a bulk that has this theta equals pi, if the surfaces are insulating, I should have said this before, the conditions that I was talking about before about the surface anomalous Hall conductivities being these integer uh, shifted values uh, requires that the surfaces be insulating. So, and if they have different values on different faces, then you have these um, uh, one dimensional chiral hinge modes running along on the the, you know, the edges, the hinges, these things have come to be called hinges, where facets meet, uh, people call them hinges. You have these um, uh, electronic uh, one-dimensional modes uh, running on the hinges. Um, that's very interesting if you can do that. Uh, in the case of a strong topological insulator, the surfaces are normally metallic. The only way to see this effect is to break time reversal symmetry at the surfaces in order to make the surfaces insulating. Um, for an axion insulator, the um, theta equals pi topology is protected by inversion. And inversion is never a symmetry at a surface because there's vacuum on one side and not on the other side. So the surfaces can be naturally gapped on an uh, axion insulator, whereas for a strong topological insulator, the surfaces are not uh, naturally gapped. What happens is that you have these Dirac cones on the surface if you don't break time reversal symmetry. So the surfaces are necessarily uh, conducting. And when you add the conduct, conducting piece of the story, you correctly predict the fact that the surface anomalous fault conductivity is zero. You know that that had to be true because the whole system, if it has time reversal symmetry, you can't have a, a anomalous fault conductivity is not consistent with time reversal symmetry. But for the axion insulator, uh, you can have a, a system where there is no metallic component, the surface is insulating, and you still have this half integer quantum anomalous Hall effect. So let me just uh, give you a sense of uh, where we uh, go with this. Um, we currently uh, don't know of any material realizations. Um, there was a suggestion back in a paper 10 years ago that a certain class of pyrochlor iridates would uh, do this. This is sort of a picture of what this material looks like. 
And these are materials where there's a non-collinear spin arrangement on uh, tetrahedral arrangements of the magnetic ions with a, what's called an all-in, all-out arrangement. It turns out that these materials in real life are not axion insulators, but uh, my student Nico Varnava generated a tight binding model. And uh, this bl light blue phase is the trivial real behavior of real pyrochlor iridates. But we put the model in the uh, axion insulator phase and uh, showed that the surfaces can be insulating and uh, calculated the surface anomalous hall conductivity on different facets for this toy model. And uh, here I'm <clears throat> color coding the facets by whether the surface anomalous hall conductivity is plus E squared over H or minus E squared over H in an outward directed sense. Um, in this particular case, the anomalous hall conductivity is globally in the upper right direction, but in the outward directed sense, it's outward on one side and inward on the other side. And the reason that's important is <clears throat> when you look at all the possible facets of a crystal light, then whenever there's a transition from an outward directed to an e inward directed anomalous Hall conductivity of half a quantum, then you have chiral hinge states running along the hinges. So uh, the rest of my uh, three minutes, two minutes is just uh, pictures. Uh, the rest of it is just pictures. Uh, we started thinking about what you can do with these um, modes if they, if you can uh, have materials that behave like this and you can start to manipulate them. So for example, suppose I start this material in a paramagnetic configuration, then um, nothing interesting is happening, but I apply a magnetic field that generates a ferromagnetic um, uh, state where the ferromagnetism is in the X direction. And what we found is that that makes four of the surfaces blue and four of them red. Remember this means plus and minus half a quantum, which means that you have chiral edge channels uh, connecting like this, which means that the top wire and the bottom wire are connected, but the left wire and the right wire are not. And now you rotate the magnetic field and it goes the other way. And now the left wire and the right wire are connected, but the top wire and the bottom wire are not. And so you have a kind of a double, double throw switch uh, by rotating the magnetic field on this crystallite. Um, another thing uh, we realized is that there are uh, some materials that have the property that when there's a half height step <clears throat> on, the, on the surface, and this happened in our pyrochlor model um, that we were studying, the type finding model that I mentioned, when there's a, a half height step, it turns out that the um, uh, anomalous Hall conductivity switches from plus a half to minus a half which means that every half height step automatically has a, a unidirectional chiral channel uh, running along the step. Um, here's another thing. Uh, if this, um, uh, if this, um, this was an all in, all out, um, you know, uh, antiferromagnetic system, you can have an antiferromagnetic domain wall where in the corresponding unit, instead of being all out, it's all in, um, it changes across the domain wall. Where the domain wall hits the surface, we also have a transition from plus a half to minus a half, which means that we have a chiral edge channel uh, running along that intersection of the planar surface with the planar uh, domain wall. And then we realized that you can maybe make these things intersect. And that would be really interesting uh, because then you basically have two channels coming in and two channels coming out and they scatter according so to some two by two uh, unitary um, S matrix. And, uh, you know, this is at the surface of a material where you can come in with a scanning tunneling microscope tip that can maybe perturb the junction and somehow, you know, as you move the tip around, it can um, uh, modify the, um, uh, the um, scattering properties at the, at the tip. And, uh, you know, the nice thing about I mean, of course, you could intersect two steps or you could inter intersect two domain walls. But the nice thing about intersecting a step in a domain wall is that it can't really come apart. These things can come apart. They can, they can you know, either uh, um, break through one way or break through the other way. But the domain wall and the step sort of have to intersect. And so uh, this is a relatively robust um, uh, intersection. And um, we have a, a paper on the archive that we've submitted and uh, just resubmitted trying to get this published about uh, the behavior of these um, uh, intersections in, in a model system. So uh, I'm gonna skip that. Uh, 
I'm at the end of my talk. Um, I uh, uh, could have told you uh, more about our efforts to uh, try to do first principles theory to find materials realizations of the axion insulators. <laughs> the reason I didn't is because we haven't succeeded. Um, and uh, 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 so, uh, you know, there, there is this um, uh, manganese um, bismuth selenide material that I mentioned earlier is a sort of example of this. Um, it's in the right direction. Uh, people are working to see if it's really a good example or not. Uh, but we're really looking forward to a future of uh, hopefully finding materials of this class and being able to build the kind of devices that I've been um, optimistically showing you in the, in the last part of this presentation. So I'll stop there and ask for questions. Thank you. Um, so let's see, uh, you can either post your questions. Uh, thank you for a very educational talk. Um, people can just unmute themselves if you want to give a question or raise your hand or post your questions on the chat and then I'll try to read them for you or call on you. Yeah, I'm not seeing Any the chat, so, so Walter, you do it or else people should just um, unmute and, and just go. Yeah, yeah, I think it's easiest if people just unmute themselves. So, so I have a question. Good. Okay. Sure. And Good. during the talk, you mentioned the. Can you switch your camera? Huh? It's kind of nicer to see people when you ask a question. <laughs> yeah. But then I have to kind of close the door behind me. That's uh, oh, then I have no, to move the seat. I think. <laughs> <laughs> so so when uh, you, you mentioned for quantum Hall effect, uh, it has to be uh, under a very low temperature, but uh, uh, in my impression, uh, this uh, quantum anom anomalous Hall effect related uh, uh, devices in principle, uh, they don't uh, have the constraints in terms of temperature. Yeah. Uh, why is that? So in the quantum Hall effect, um, you um, apply the transverse magnetic field and the Landau level spacing is proportional to the uh, magnetic field. And so the, the gap in the system, you put the Fermi level in between two um, Landau levels and the gap in the system is, um, you know, is H bar times the cyclotron frequency, which is the level spacing between the Landau levels. Um, and that's, uh, that's typically a very small um, uh, energy level. Even if you get up to very powerful uh, magnetic fields, that's still a relatively small uh, energy spacing. Um, whereas um, what we're looking for uh, in the quantum anomalous hole systems, uh, for example, the one that I showed with this uh, europium nitride, gadolinium nitride, the, the, the thing that generates the energy scale of the gap is chemistry. Um, it turns out that uh, the energy scale is really related to the strength of spin orbit coupling. Uh, you can do an argument that says that if you take spin orbit coupling and treat it as a, a, a continuous parameter that you can send continuously to zero, um, if you start with a topological system with the uh, physical value of uh, spin orbit coupling and then send it to zero, when you get to zero, if the system is an insulator, it has to be a trivial, trivial insulator, which means the gap had to close somewhere along the way. So that means that the gap is on the order of the strength of spin orbit coupling. And for the, for the, for the materials that the, like lead and bismuth and so on, that's on the order of half an electron volt. So you can hope to get a material where the gap is based on spin orbit chemistry on the order of half an electron volt. Whereas in the uh, quantum Hall effect, it, the gap is, is given by the uh, transverse magnetic field, which you're limited. Uh, thanks. I guess questions? I had a follow-up question to that, which is um, in, in graphene, um, I guess the scales are a little bit different, so you can get to quite high temperatures even with the conventional quantum Hall effect. Yes, so there, there is a paper. So what happens in graphene is that the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the Landau level spectrum looks different. So if you have a parabolic band, the Landau levels are equally spaced. Instead, in graphene, you have this um, a Dirac crossing, and then there's one Landau level exactly at the crossing, and then the others are unequally spaced with the largest gap being the first one. And if you put the Fermi level in the first gap, um, it's a relatively large gap, 
and then you can get a, a quantum anomalous hall. And so there is a paper where I think they have something in the, in the title about quantum anomalous hall at room temperature. I think it's, it's only quantized within a few percent or something, but it's, so, so that's right. So graphene is a, thank, thank you for the comment. That's a good comment. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, the question I wanted to ask was a little bit different, which is um, how robust are these axion insulators uh, to disorder, let's say, compared to strong topological insulators? So um, it's, the, it's basically the, the same story, which is that um, uh, uh, topological properties of this kind are robust against perturbative disorder and they're robust against perturbative electron-electron interactions. So what I mean is that if you, if you start with zero disorder and crank up the disorder gradually, uh, nothing can change um, unless it, uh, nothing can change unless it changes. And if it changes, it changes, to, uh, you know. It, it, so, so basically what can happen is as you crank up the disorder, you start introducing localized states in the gap. But if the Fermi level is in a, a region of localized states as opposed to extended states, then the system is still topological. That's the Laughlin ar argument you probably know. If you crank up the disorder to the, uh, to the level that you get the, uh, the, the um, mobility edges uh, collapse and the Fermi level is in a, it becomes in a extended states, uh, then the system is metallic and then it can open the gap again into a different topological state. So, um, or it could be that, you know, as you, well, with interactions in particular, if you crank up interactions, there could be a first order phase transition into another state, like the one third quantum Hall state or something. But, but the idea is that with, with respect to both um, disorder or interactions, for the most part, you know, if you imagine turning it on as a function of some uh, strength parameter lambda, uh, everything remains quantized up to some critical value of lambda where it becomes metallic or you get a phase transition or something. And, and that applies to the axion insulators in the same way as to ordinary um, strong topological insulators. At least as far as I understand. I mean, I haven't really studied the disorder problem, but that's, that's the consensus view of the community. Hi, hi David. Um, I have a question. Uh, uh, thanks for the uh, for the nice talk. Um, so you mentioned that in axion insulator, um, it has this uh, half quantized uh, top uh, anomalous Hall connectivity uh, due to the uh, broken inversion symmetry at the surface. So I was wondering, is there a way to uh, determine the sign of the uh, anomalous Hall connectivity um, by uh, symmetry arguments? Um, yeah, so that's a good question. And, and in fact, you know, the, the question of what is the sign um, uh, of the um, anomalous Hall conductivity on different surfaces was, was really a lot of the motivation behind this uh, project with Nico. Um, uh, for a given system, um, it correlates with um, magnetization. So, um, the symmetry, so if I have a, a two-dimensional system or a surface of a three-dimensional system, the symmetry conditions that allow for there to be a, a non-zero quantum anomalous Hall effect are the same symmetry conditions that allow there to be a perpendicular magnetization. And so um, in practice, it correlates with the surface magnetization. If the magnetization is pointing out of the surface, I'll get one sign. And if the magnetization is pointing into the surface, I'll get the other sign. Uh, at least roughly speaking. Now in Nico's paper, he actually did some cases where he continuously rotated the magnetization from the up direction to the down direction. And you see the gap close and then open up again uh, and um, in the, in the surface, um, uh, in, in the surface uh, band structure. Um, and you see this thing uh, reverse. Uh, if you do it in a symmetry direction, it reverses when the magnetization is exactly parallel to the surface, but in a general direction, Direction. It's not exactly at that angle, but so roughly speaking, it depends uh, with the surface magnetization. However, if you go from material A to material B, uh, it could be that the 
you know, the sign assignment reverses. In other words, it could be that for material A, when the magnetization is out, the anomalous Hall conductivity is positive. <clears throat> whereas for material B, when the magnetization out, it's, it's negative. You know, so it, it depends upon the, the, the specifics of the surface. I, I don't know that there's any universal thing that you can say. So how about roughly, the, speaking, like, it, it, roughly speaking, it goes with the magnetization at the surface. So is there a, a, a axion insulator that, uh, that is uh, anti-ferromagnet? Yeah, so um, I don't know if I, let me see what I have in terms of slides here. Well, okay, so let me show, um, uh, let me show this. So uh, I mentioned this a couple of times and maybe I should have put it in my talk, but I knew I was gonna run out of time. This is the manganese bismuth telluride material. So it's a little bit like the um, bismuth selenide class materials, but it has an extra layer of manganese uh, in here. And so instead of a quintuple layer, it's built out of septuple layers. And the uh, manganese uh, are magnetic and the magnetic ions uh, moments are uh, aligned within a layer and alternate from layer to layer. And so, uh, uh, so this is the thing that um, I said is uh, the closest thing we really have up to now to an axion insulator. Uh, you can regard it as protected by inversion um, uh, taken on a, a inversion center on one of the manganese atoms or you can regard it as protected by uh, a half translation times time reversal, which is what I wrote, wrote down here, and, or by inversion. So it's actually protected by both. Um, so again, <clears throat> you know, if you terminate on this uh, top layer, then the surface is mostly spin up and you get plus E squared over uh, 2H. And if instead you terminate uh, down here, the surface layer is mostly down. So that's minus E squared over H. And that explains what I told you before about how you can have a case where when you have a single height, a half height step, um, you get a, a reversal of the uh, anomalous hole conductivity and you get a chiral channel on the step. So, so, so that's an example of, 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 of a system like that. The problem with this system is that it's, uh, according to theory, supposed to have a, 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 a gap, a, a gapped surface. And according to the best ARPES experiments done to date, it doesn't have a gapped surface, at least for the bulk material. So that's a mystery that we don't understand. Okay, so I see there is a question from uh, Mandela, if we can move to that. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for the interesting talk. So I think in one of the slides you skipped, there was a churn simons three form. Yes, there was a churn simons three form. That's exactly right. Yeah, and my question was, so, I mean, earlier when you were in one of the slides, you were showing the cylinder, I got the impression of mapping circles into circles, which is what you would expect from an abelian gauge theory. But this Trent Simons uh, three form looks a lot like a non abelian, like that of a non abelian gauge theory. Exactly, it's a non abelian thing. So, the um, berry phase that I was describing before. Thank you. 